Welcome to Trauma Research Foundation's TRF Tuesday. This is our weekly mini workshop series from Bright Voices in Therapeutic Embodiment. If you're watching on YouTube, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It is the best way to let YouTube know that this content is valuable to you and to show it to more people. So without further delay, I hand off to the crew. Take Thank it you, away. Mary. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, hello, everyone, and <laughs> let us uh, allow us a moment to explain. <laughs> we're we, uh, we are in costume because we're in the middle of tech, uh, what's called tech rehearsals, which are the technical. We're adding the tech technological aspects of theater, light, sound, and costumes. We're quite literally out this door uh, in the at Theater Row in New York City, rehearsing our third of three Shakespeare adaptations told from a military veterans and a trauma narrative or trauma uh, lens. And so we're in the middle of tech and just zipped out here to, to do this class. So and uh, yes, and so we have non-period glasses, yes. but uh, please bear with us. Missing the crown. <laughs> in the crown, yes, okay. which we do have, of course. <laughs> Uh, but yes, um, so thank you and uh, for indulging us in our costumes as we're here. Um, I'm going to give you a moment to land, to settle in, uh, as Mary said, be here, be present. We always start with a, um, usually start with a check-in and or uh, grounding exercise, mindfulness, we, we call it now, as well, and uh, get us to get us here and now into this place. So take a moment to feel, if you're seated, to feel your backside in the chair. If you have feet and you, they are on the ground or folded up on a, underneath you, feel those feet and perhaps wiggle those toes. If you do not have feet and you had them at one time, my brothers and sisters in arms and perhaps lost them um, through a traumatic event uh, or medical, um, recall when you had those. So imagine that you had them. And uh, for anyone who's never had them, you can feel the lowest part of your body in space. Feel the breath fall in and out of your torso. Feel how fluid our body is. If it helps to imagine an infant breathing, and if you've ever seen an infant when they breathe, they breathe, their whole body is a bellows, moving in a very fluid motion. Without muscularity or effort, they're breathing, just allowing the breathing mechanisms to work because we've not interfered with that breathing mechanism yet in infants, either through trauma, social engineering, what have you. The child is breathing. So bring yourself back to that state. Soften the jaw. Allow your lower jaw to hang free from your upper, your skull, from your upper jaw. If you are able, allow your lips to be parted. As we're doing this, we're turning our focus inward. As I often will share with my brothers and sisters in arms with vet veterans, if it helps as you turn your focus inward to take a moment to notice your points of safety or your egress points, we call them. Where are my exits in the room? Are they secure enough for me to be able to turn my focus inward? If you need to do so, please make that a part of your ru routine. As you're embracing your routine of security in the space, come back to the body, turning your focus inward. Your eyes can be wherever you want. People often ask, do your eyes have to be closed? Nope, they don't. Um, and as a veteran, I'm very unable to close my eyes very long, for very long. But you can soft focus, perhaps. Allow that jaw to hang, allow to be a mouth breather, letting the f air flow in and out <sighs> in the torso. As you breathe in and out, take a, just a slight suspense at the top and the bottom of your breath. So for example, as Dawn breathes in, she's going to suspend at just the top before between the inhale and the out, and then she'll exit through the pursed lips. When she gets to the bottom, she'll pause for just a moment to suspend in between the exhale and the inhale. Back in, suspend, and out. Right. This time we're going to add some humming. We're going to add some um, breathe typically for a moment, as I explain. We're going to introduce breath. We've been breathing. Now we're going to add focus breath. Then we'll add sound. With As with everything that we do here, you have autonomy over your experience. You can do or not do it. You can change it and modify it according to your impulses. <clears throat> there is no one formula to mindfulness, to grounding, to meditation, in my opinion, or any of these um, 
exercises that bring us back into our body. Find what's uniquely yours. I'm going to suspend this, this for a moment to share with you that if you think for a moment, the military brought all of us together who didn't know how to stand at position of attention or parade rest or any of these things and got us to do it very quickly. And if you'll throw aside for a moment the deprivation and the, 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 um, the violence, if you will, the verbal violence and the stress that they added, which are a different reason. We'll talk another time about that. But how do they do it? And through repetition, repetition, repetition. They create a routine and they reward when we do it well. And in their case, punish when we do it wrong. But in this case, we're going to create a routine. So if we can learn to fire a weapon, if we can stand a position of attention, we can certainly begin a routine for ourselves to be present here in this space. So coming back to your body, observing your body where it's making contact with objects that are not your own body, perhaps a seat, perhaps the floor, perhaps a wall, perhaps a bed, whatever it is. Perhaps your arms are resting against your own body, checking back in with that jaw, rechecking our points of egress, creating our own routine of how to find security in a room to turn inward for a moment. Soften the jaw, allow the breath to be flow in and out of the mouth. And this time, as we inhale, we'll suspend and we're just going to add a little humming, high-pitched humming. And imagine sending it up to your crown, as Shakespeare called it, to the top of your head of... Just sending sound. Observe if you feel it, observe if you don't. Now out the eyes. You can pitch, pick the pitch we're using or a different one. This is all the nice thing about theater is you get to try things and no one dies if it's different than others. Now from the throat. Now from the torso. And now from the belly and the groin, as low of a pitch as you can muster, even if it feels false. Mm. Going from low to high, we're going to go from low, op, closed mouth to open. We're going to do this fairly rapidly. Bear with us. Stay with us. Dare to fail. Again, remember that theater, in theater we make plays. And they're called that for a reason, because it should be playful. Because we know, as we just talked about, I think it was two classes ago, Bessel writes in his book, that those of us who survive trauma, our sense of play gets diminished because things become life or death, that binary of life or death. There is no in-between of play or art. We're teaching our bodies that we can have play, we can have art, we can be playful, even if it's in the micro of daring to make sound that I've never made before. So from here, feeling our body, softening that jaw, focusing on our sternum as well. Let's add that sternum. Is my sternum pointing towards the ground? Or is it pointing towards the wall across from me? Is it pointing up? Where is it? Just observe it. There is no right answer. We're just observing. Where is it? If you want to adjust it, adjust it. You don't have to. But from here, going the low pitch again, I'm going to breathe in. And on an open mouth, we're going to do a low pitch exhale. Oh. Embrace the ridiculousness of it. Look at look huh. at our costumes. <laughs> <laughs> that should help. Right? If we, if we, if we, you can't be as ridiculous as we are. Then <laughs> where, where's, where are we in the world? Mm -hmm. Next, from the tor from the torso and the sternum. Ah. Ah. From ah. the throat and jaw. Ah. 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 From the eyes and sinuses. I'm just messing around making noise. Now from way up here in our falsetto voice, think Monty Python. Now we're going to go in a single breath from the highest to the lowest and the lowest to highest. If I'm going too fast, take a breath and know that you have time and it's just an exercise. Dare to mess it up. Dare to try something that I'm not doing. Exhale into the space. <sighs> Inhale deeply. Suspend. And from high pitch to low pitch through an open mouth, make sound. <sighs> yeah. Now from low to high. 
And now check in for a moment with your body and observe, yeah, and feel free to do anything that Dawn's doing. For those who've done equine therapy or anything along the lines of working with horses, and even dogs sometimes do this, when we're working in an intense um, therapeutic environment, we work with, for example, Jane Strong at, at, at uh, um, uh, uh, the Equus Effect. And what Jane does is when she works with the horses and the veterans, she'll need to give the horses a break. And they'll run out into the field and do exactly what Dawn's doing. They'll <laughs> do what we call horse lips in theater, <laughs> just exhaling and relaxing the jaw and face. They'll jump, they'll neigh, they'll make sound, they'll twitch, they'll roll, they'll um, uh, reel, reel back and run. So allow your yourself to do a standing version standing version whatever you want to do run around the room this I is like, to release stuff yeah. yeah I like I like um, the wipes and yeah the wipes the Tai Chi mm -hmm. physical contact physical version contacts yeah and, and lovely so let me lovely get, let me thank you in the thing. But, uh, yeah yeah sometimes just um, <laughs> in theater a lot and even with Shakespeare Sometimes I'm out of my body one way or another, nerves or audience, whatever it is, and I need um, contact. Mm -hmm. um, What's the mantra you sometimes say when you do that, when you grab your head? Take a break. Oh, yeah, take I've a break. Her, I've seen her yeah. go into the corner. <laughs> I was like, go, what? Take a break. A break, yes. Give that ADH I get, brain I, a moment to yes, rest. Yes, busy, 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 meaning yeah. making. <laughs> Mantras matter. They help. Yeah, yeah. The sound. So, why are we making all these ridiculous sounds? What's the purpose? Well, I'm going to only give you a partial answer, uh, and we're going to do it through your experience because we'd rather, in Decroup, because it's theater based, one of the things we love about theater is we get to try things in a room and see what we learn, and then perhaps try the opposite of what we just tried. The great thing about it versus my old job in the Army is, in theater we get to try things and there's no real risk of life or death. It may feel like it, but it's not. No one actually dies. Whereas the old job, we didn't have that luxury, right? And those of us who survive trauma, um, Bessel talks about, and, and Stephen Porges does as well in, in, in polyvagal theory, being hijacked back to our traumatic experience, our traumatic environment. We get hijacked back to that moment. We don't have our own ex uh, executive function. We're not able to do as Don did to say, take a break, because we're hijacked by it. What we're going to offer is, in theater, we get to convert that into um, sound and movement to release it. So that then we can, instead of trying to make meaning of it, just exorcise it and see what happens. With that, I'm going to share the screen here for a moment. Um, and uh, first things first, we'll whoops, hopefully you can see this. Um, first, we'll start with the, quote, the p passage from Bessel's book where he talks on page three, we can now develop methods and experiences that utilize the brain's own natural neuroplasticity to help survivors feel fully alive in the present and move on with their lives. There are fundamentally three avenues, top down by talking and reconnecting with others and allowing ourselves to know and understand what is going on with us while processing the memories of the trauma. Two, by taking medicines that shut down inappropriate alarm reactions, or by utilizing other technologies that change the way the brain organizes information. I think uh, neurofeedback is an example of that, among others. And three, the bottom up, by allowing the body to have experiences that deeply and viscerally contradict the helplessness, rage, or collapse that result from trauma. And in the third, I, uh, is where we find theater. So, what, where's an example of that? Keeping in mind what we just did with breathing in and on the exhale making sound, we're going to do the same thing with these passages. It'll be a call and respond. Dawn and I will do it, um, and we're going to do it in sync. We're not trying to be in sync here. And then we're going to leave room for you to do it. Um, also, uh, with the time constraint, we may be fairly rapid, Feel free to pause so when I, we do a version of it, you can stop and do your own version. If you're recording and those who are with us live, 
bear with us, but uh, we'll give you time to do it yourself. So you can feel in your body rather than us tell you, this is what's happening and this is what Shakespeare means. We do the opposite in Decrute. We give you the text, you say it however you want without correction, without shaming, without pronunciation corrections, none of that. And then you tell us what you're getting out of it. Who cares what a scholar uh, says about how, what that line means? I don't care. I know that when it affects me, it's personal and someone else may have a different experience and it's not for me to tell them what it should be or vice versa. Thank you for allowing me to explain. So in this excerpt, we have two lines. You'll see here from Julius Caesar, oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth. And then the second line is that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. Here's all I want you to do is to breathe in before each new line, before the O and before the word that. Notice what we're doing. We're countering years of education that says breathe at the punctuation. We're literally discombobulating the central nervous system. That's okay. See what happens. Breathe in and on the exhale, say the first line. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth. Breathe in. Next line. That I am meek and gentle with these butchers. Observe what happened. Observe if you were able to breathe in and say the line. Observe if you had extra air at the end of the line. Observe if you breathed in and exhaled a little bit and then spoke. All of these things are valuable information. That's all we're trying to find out is what does my body do when I do this exercise? Literally, that's it. We're going to do it again. This time, we're going to elongate it. We're going to luxuriate in these words that we don't get to say in everyday life, um, these wonderful poetic lines and words. So with that, breathe in, very slowly over enunciating, say the first line. Oh, oh pardon, pardon me, me thou, thou bleeding, bleeding piece, piece of, of earth. earth. Breathe in, next line. That, that I am, I am meek and gentle, and gentle with, these, with these, butchers. these butchers. So luxuriate in the sounds that Shakespeare has given us and observe what you feel with that. Observe what things that come easy, what things are more challenging, what things vibrate that may have never vibrated before or, or we often don't get a chance to, what things don't vibrate that you thought might. Observe all the things that happen with this. One more time with the same passage, really elongating the vowels, A-E-I-O-U. It's not an English exercise, it's just an exercise. Breathing in, overdoing the vowels for fun. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth. Just that much. Do it on your own for a moment. And we're going to contrast that with an action line, something where Henry V is in the middle of battle and he wants his men, in this case it was men, to charge back into the hole they've made in the castle because they've been repelled. And instead of the, the vowels that, that, that Mark Anthony has that he's saying over his, his uh, activation warning, his dead friend right in front of him, vowels, oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth. In this case, we need someone to do something. So what does Henry say? Breathe in. First line, once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more. Next line, or close the wall up with our English dead. There's a natural consonance to it. There's a natural action driving to it. There's a natural uh, uh, rhythm to it, all. clip, yes. And one more, we're gonna do Coriolanus here and then we'll talk about what we're after here or what we hopefully are demonstrating here. This single partial line here of Coriolanus, one of my favorite veterans in all of Shakespeare who toured at least 17 combat tours, and then returned home and lo and behold, he had difficulty transitioning to civilian life. And to make matters worse, they tried to then ally, ask him to be a politician, where he was supposed to use his words instead of his military action and training and physical violence. He had to use his words that he lacked. So he gets banished, and what's the first thing he calls everyone? You common cry of curs. You common cry of curs. Feel that the sound in the back of the throat, that ka, k, 
common cry of curs. For those who may be wondering, curs is generally speaking a dog, but whatever it means to you, whatever came up for you matters more. You common cry of curs. So, I. Uh, I'm gonna do one more. I know I'm running on time, but I'm gonna do one more because I want to leave us on a on a happy one. If we go to Orsino, the first words that Orsino, this man who is sick in love in Twelfth Night, says, "If music be the food of love, play on." Now you. If music be the food of love. Play on. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's better to end with a with yeah. a with a right with a love sickness or a more positive or a, a longing, if you will. Um, I know we have some chat too that I'm gonna check, but I want to share one more thing before that. Here's here's the thing we're asked most: Why Shakespeare? We could go on. I've said this every week. We could go on and on for the reasons we've talked a little bit about in the past, though that. For one, he provides language that we may be lacking because we know from Bessel's book that when we're in a traumatic experience, we struggle to find the language to access Broca's area. So Shakespeare gives us language that we might have, might have otherwise lacked. We've already talked about the rhythm that Shakespeare wrote in, which is actually our natural human rhythm, which we're going to expand on in just a moment. But um, because it's already in our natural human rhythm, uh, uh, it also gives us a template of how to speak about very personal things, yet self-regulate, because we're breathing in before each new line of Shakespeare's verse. And for anyone who's going to go look at some Shakespeare um, from this, you may, you may want to respell. You did decrude. Um, oh, darn um, it. It's okay. She's going to so retype sorry. her name, uh, <laughs> the correct email. Um, but Shakespeare uh, uh, provides um, the language for us that we may be lacking and a template of how to breathe so that we can talk about very personal things very publicly and have language for it. There are a bunch more. Obviously, he wrote uh, The Human Experience very brilliantly. He wrote The Veteran Experience specifically very brilliantly. Uh, there are lots of other reasons, but one that seems to really land with a lot of people is when we share this, which is um, uh, a researcher by the, and psychotherapist by the name of uh, Strozier, who worked with, and this is an activation warning, I'm going to show uh, passage from an anonymous patient of his uh, from describing 9-11. So if, you, if that's activating, take a breath, make some physical contact with yourself, soften the jaw, know that we're going to hit it briefly, but it's not about reliving the experience, but rather showing this person's, uh, uh, Strozier's rather, experience with this person. I'm going fast. Let me apologize for a moment, even though it's apology-free zone. Take a breath myself. What Strozier found was that when he was working with his patients and they spoke about 9-11, this is right after it, they had not yet processed their trauma. They had not yet integrated their experience. It was not a memory, but a physiological experience that they re-experienced when it came up. And when they spoke about it and Strozier was recording it and having it transcribed, and it was transcribed here in the blue, in prose, it was written like a regular old document from one side of the page to the other. But when Strozier read it, he couldn't make sense of it. He thought it doesn't make as much sense as when they're speaking it, mm -hmm. even though they're talking about an experience that doesn't make any sense, right? Because it was a traumatic experience. And what he found was when he went back to the document and hit return, beginning a new line, every time the patient took a breath, he found that by and large, most of his patients it came out like this, what's in green on the screen there. It came out, as he describes it, as blank verse. And very often with what's called iambic pentameter or iambic feet, which is what Shakespeare wrote. Shakespeare wrote in an iambic rhythm, five heartbeats per line. <gasps> to be or not to be, that is the question. If music be the food of love, play on. Right? This five rhythm beat, take a new breath. And he found Iambic pentameter is the language of unprocessed trauma. If we look at that passage, we can see that, I'm gonna read a little bit, activation warning, just a line or two. I think just a million things are going through my, at that point, I was kind of trying not to, it was like every second something worse kept happening. I'm going to read just that much so you can hear that the person taking the breath and the reader can actually take a breath and, well, I'm not going to interpret for you. That's not fair. But rather, it helps us digest 
as a listener. It also helps us stay regulated as a speaker. And that's the point of it, that Shakespeare... Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say very, very um, noticeably different, different. from... Ah. I think just a million things are going through my... At that point, I was just kind of trying to... It was like every second something worse kept happening. Yes. It's just, just a ramble on. When you take in account the breath, the meaning actually becomes yes. clearer. Yes, it reactivates when yeah. you read it like that. So, I jumped around. Thank you for bearing with me. But what I wanted, what we wanted to share there was that, that not just the brilliance of Shakespeare and that somehow he wrote the language of trauma over 400 years ago and wrote about the human experience, but on top of that, the poetry, any, I think any poetry honestly works, but Shakespeare, the reason it speaks to us so much is because he gives us that template to breathe and that our body already recognizes Shakespeare's poetry as unprocessed trauma, as the language of unintegrated and unintegrated experience. And if you think about Shakespeare's actors in his day, we know that they didn't have artificial lighting. They did it in the middle of the day outside where the actors could see the audience. So we know it was a group therapy moment. We know that Hamlet came out and directly spoke to the audience and asked the audience for help to be or not to be that is the question no one would respond whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them to die to sleep and how many audience members listening are having that resonate in their own bodies how many are having their breath now be modified by the speakers, by Hamlet asking the same questions. And when we hear it, we feel less alone as well. And we have that connectivity, which helps us, as Jonathan Shea says, communalize our trauma. So that was a lot. It was done like a machine gun. And for that, I apologize. Just brrr, But I wanted to get as much as possible in for today um, and, and, and share that so we can go on. Um, thank you for the sharing. I'm going to look if there were some questions, perhaps, or bring... Hi, Mary. <laughs> Turn it over to you. <laughs> ah, there's so much to get through. And so I know fun. it's hard to choose. Yeah, and the work is so creative. It's so cool. Thank yeah, you. It's just watching the veterans in the room speak, and the you know out of their mouths the vowels, the consonants, and what resonates with them. Yeah. The other meaning doesn't, no other meaning matters, but what the body is, you know, what's happening in the body when they're making these, this resonance. Yeah. And that's, I mean, the personal experience. Yeah. yeah. The personal rather than the, the actor version. Right. Yeah. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank if you. If anyone has a, uh, we're over time, but if anyone has um, a quick question, they can post it in the chat and, um, We've got excellent. Thanks so much from Canada. Yeah, thank you, Canada. I want to give a shout out to Art for Vets too. P Penny's been joining us every week. Thank you for, and they're they're doing that up in, using art and uh, as a healing tool up in in Saratoga Springs, New York. But quick shout out. That's all. I got a quick thing. Maybe we can end on. Um, so, both of you can give me an answer here. What is something that you hope somebody watching this who may not be a vet takes away and can apply to their everyday life? Oh, lovely. Thank you. Great question. Because we do work with not just uh, veterans anymore. We work with our uh, other unique populations that we are, uh, some we're both share and some uh, individually. But it's that, that the arts, arts are not just a pleasant hobby, but they are an actual therapeutic tool. They're an actual outlet, and that in 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 our opinion, and we're biased, but but uh, if you look at the history of theater, psychology came from our craft, not the other way around. Psychology was born from the interpretation of dreams. Psychology was born from putting uh, 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 using putting art uh, as in at the forefront. If we look at the Greek theater of 2,500 years ago, those were military veterans speaking their experience on stage to the audience who were partial veterans, but half were not. The other half were family of veterans. Um, and then if, and if they weren't necessarily, they're still hearing the war experience right on stage. Yeah. No, I was, I'm reading the oh. comments and saying, and oh, thank thanking you, you, thanking you for those um, comments. So yeah, but to, but to yeah. really consider art as an actual 
outlet medicine. an actual tool <laughs> as medicine as our friend Yvette Nolan yeah, calls it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's it. And then I love uh, this question. Oh yeah, does it does all? Does it all come down to co-regulated breathing? I mean, breath. It, I, breath is a part of the. I I think regulation tool. It's a great for question. Sure. Yeah, Devin asked, does right, it all come down to co-regulated breathing? I um, uh, I, I think that's a vitally. We think it's a vitally import, important point. We think it's a foundation, but I think it's more about um. The breath, the foundation is the breath to the, that the scaffolding is built upon right. and that our breath gives us so much information as a foundation to build the other scaffolding That's because right. the breath, if we start with the breath and don't go on to the next thing until we understand what our breath is doing. Um, there's no, uh, the, for us, there's less pointing going on because if we don't, we, uh, it's important to know if I can even observe my breath. For example, there are many vets who will, will say, breathe in and speak a line of text. They'll breathe in and go, oh, for me is a fire that would ascend, right? And then we'll ask, are you aware that you're exhaling before you speak? Oh, I'm not. So we have a lot there, a lot of information right there. One of the questions we ask in Decrude is, what do you feel, the breath? Where do you feel it? When else in your life do you feel it? And when is the earliest you recall feeling that? So we can begin, begin to unpack, oh right, I was never really allowed to take up time and space in my home. So I exhale to diminish myself for others. Um, this came up last night in mm -hmm. Decruit, um, and, and someone saying, I, I couldn't, it was a threat, I was a threat if I did that, so I had to remain invisible. So that, it, it, it's less about it all just coming down to it, but being yeah. the place to begin. Yeah, it's, it's the, you said it when you said it's the scaffolding of which things are built on, but we are a group, we are a group model, and um, is it Jonathan Shea that said the communalization of yes. trauma, right? So what we are finding um, is the observation without judgment, um, the breath as the base, but also the group. Yeah. The group dynamic is very, very important because in that you have being witnessed and being, see, you know, being seen and heard and heard. Yeah. And that's just something trauma robs. And doing it for others. So much. And right. And then being and being able to be there for others and having a reciprocal. Right. Which yeah. is something the circle gives us. So I think it's not the only thing, but it in, and yet it's nothing without it. So it's yeah. definitely the base. You're right. Answer. Yeah. Perfectly put. Thank you. Great question. Um, any others? Thank you for the yeah. lovely comments as uh, well, everyone. Yeah. You're very Beautiful. kind. In addition to Cry Havoc, are there personalized monologues from other veterans that they have okayed others viewing? Hmm. Ooh, uh, uh, excellent question, Harvey Stone. That's I, coming. That's coming. Yeah, that so is you're, coming. You're, you're yeah, yeah. Do the monologue we are working formula. on that. We've been very particular. Um, we've not filmed much in. In fact, Penny uh, was one of the few groups uh, up in Saratoga Springs that we did do that because the the eye in the room changes the dynamic, mm -hmm. and we always wanted to be. A place where what's said there stays there. What's learned there can leave there, but what's said there stays there. So we've we've on very few occasions we've done it, and then if we get permission, we go forward, and, and that is forthcoming. We have been starting to do that. Yeah, so the, there slowly. are there are monologues. Stefan edited specifically twenty two for use specifically with the veteran population. But then as we went into recovery centers and prisons, there were other monologues that came and and. Um, we're, we're working on a, on a book right now that shows how we use the monologue because we don't use a casting system. They actually choose their own monologues based on writing prompts, which bring up emotions. Emotions are connected to the monologues that yeah. they don't know. So they've chosen their monologue and, and, and don't know it. Yeah. Um, so there's a whole system and, and we'll be talking more about that. And the, there was, the I'll throw one out. We used this last week, the last thing, mm -hmm. uh, if I may. Um, people were asking about some other monologues. If, if you're looking, I, I think Sonnet 35 oh, yeah. is an excellent place. If anyone's wondering, well, how do I piece out a monologue? Because we edit them down, make no mistake. Most of the monologues get edited down and that's through, been through trial and error of decades. And this will be in a book, yes, we hope within, by the end of the year. <laughs> 
uh, those monologues in a book for you to be able to use. But Sonnet 35 is excellent because it's somewhat of a perfect form, sonnets are. They have a thesis, then an antithesis, and a resolution. And they leave you on this place of, oh, I can overcome this. And it begins with, no more be grieved at that, that which thou hast done. done, which is what a great line. And we've had, it's meant so much to me. And every time we put it forward, Every, as we know, so often shame and guilt are associated with our traumas. Yeah. So beginning with the line of, let's begin pr the practice of letting this go. Yeah. What a great way to start. So yeah. Sonnet 35 is an excellent piece. Yeah. So, uh, Mary. Uh, well, Stefan and Don, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us on TRF Tuesday. We've all really enjoyed this series. The work that you do is so innovative. Thank you very, very thank much. Thank you for having us. Oh, thank gosh, our so pleasure. Much.